Amen. Remember, how you start the year is going to determine how you end it. So if to get happy, get joyful, get excited. Amen. Do you believe that you're going to have a, a tremendous year? Well, three of you believe it. Three of you believe it. The rest of you come up for prayer right now. <laughs> Amen. God is good, isn't he? Uh, by the way, the outreach meeting is outreach and follow-up. So whoever is involved in follow-up and, and outreach you want to be in that meeting. It's going to be uh, a, a very uh, um, informative, and it will prepare us for the folks that are coming to the Lord. Oh, those three that keep saying amen, come up here, man. I'll preach to you. <laughs> or give the rest of these guys some coffee. Do something. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because we believe that 2024 is going to see an influx, amen, of souls coming to RLC. Amen. Do you believe it? If you believe it, say amen real loud. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Well, look, uh, um, uh, we're starting a new series in this new year, and it's called The Heart of God. The Heart of God. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I, I sometimes I think about how many people um, know God, but they only know the one side of him. And that side is the side of what God can do for us, you know. And that's okay because God is a giver, right? It's his nature. He wants to bless us. He wants to give to us. Amen. But, but do we know his heart? And the thing that, that is beautiful about, the Bible says that, that um, it talked about the disciple that Jesus loved. And it's interesting because we think he loved everyone. So why would he say that? Right? But this is what we have to understand in the natural as well as the spiritual. You will only receive the love that you give. It is the principle of sowing and reaping. If you give no love, you receive no love. Right? And so it appeared that the disciple that Jesus loved was the one that gave him the most love. Right? Draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. That's what the Bible says. And so the disciple that he loved was the one when they got together that he would literally come alongside him and the Bible says he would rest his head on his bosom. Oh, you're not here. Because he was more interested in the heart of Christ and not what he can do for him. Oh, you're not here. And, and I think this year we have to learn there has to be a shift because we place too much emphasis on, on religious things. Come on. We place too much attention on the church. And I see, I see people that spend, you know, $10, $15 million in building a church. And they do it because they want to make it perfect for people to like the church. Can I just talk today? It's a new year. And, and, and the, the, the issue is that they are competing with other churches. You all still with me? Because they feel if we make it more comfortable and nice, the people from that church will come to our church. Come on. And, you know, and, I, and I'm thinking, where is the heart of God in all this? Where's the heart of God? Are people coming to the Lord? Are people, uh, uh, and by the way, in some, a lot of those churches, they don't do outreach because they rely on church transfer. Come on. And I'm like, where, where, where? people are more interested in the 
the temple than they are God. And so what that has caused, my friend, is a church that is immature. I'm talking about the body of Christ that's immature. We measure God by what he can give us, not because of who he is. Come on. We measure God by, by you know, uh, uh, um, feelings and emotions and not by our faith in him and who he is. We're a church that started off as an outreach church. We will always be an outreach church. Amen. And we also started out as a church that will help Christians mature. Not easy. No, not easy. When, when the Lord first told me that, I said, man... We, we, we're going to have 12 people. Because nobody wants to mature. No, we, 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 we learn how to go by feelings and emotions and all that kind of stuff. We don't go by, by who God is and what he's done for us and, and, and so on and so forth. Our, our relationship with God is based on something. Whatever that something is to you. Okay, let's close in prayer. <laughs> Amen. So, the heart of God is expressed by, by a passage that even non-Christians know. It is the passage that was taught to me the first day I got saved. And it is in John chapter 3. Let's start reading at verse 14. Wow, what is this? Wrong verse. So I'm going to read it to you. Oh, there it is. The Pieta. Go back. You had it right. My bad. My, my bad. I apologize. I humble myself before you. <laughs> and look at Junior. He's got this big smile like, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John is expressing the heart of God. Come on. So he says that, that, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Next verse says, for God so loved the world. And here it is. Everybody knows this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Watch it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. My friend, let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we don't have to guess of what this is all about. You make it clear. You make clear that your heart is to love us. You paid the price for us. Thank you for that. It's not a building. It's not religion. It's a relationship. And a relationship with you will supersede anything and everything. If we learn your heart, thank you, in Jesus' name. Now watch. So what we, we read that and we rejoice because we say, man, God, you know, he sent his son Jesus, you know, to die for us so that I may be saved and so on and so forth. And that should make you happy. And that should make you glad. But realize that he did it in spite of the fact that all through the Bible, from Genesis to the New Testament, people rejected God. You ain't trying to hear me. 
Historically, we rejected the Lord for false gods. And that's so important for us to understand because during that whole time, and if you're into the Old Testament, get into it. If you, if you read the New Testament, you'll see it again, that Paul's challenge and Jesus' challenge and, 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 and the patriarchs in the Old Testament, their challenge was always trying to keep people focused on God and his heart. Because they all turn to false gods. And remember in the wilderness they built the golden calf. Right? But that is symbolic. You know, and we go like, well, that's not us. We don't do stuff like that. No, my friend, understand that false gods can be anything that you put your faith in above God. So it could be relationships. It can be money. It can be a job. You ain't hearing me. And, and, and because what, what do you do with a false god? Or what do you do with God? You worship. Whatever we worship is our God. Come, can I go here? I'm going to do it anyway. Amen. Because we go like, okay, uh, uh, this is what takes all my time. This is what I believe in. This is my allegiance and so on and so forth. And we don't realize that we're doing the exact same thing that they did. And in spite of all of that, God says, I'm sending my son. Come on. He's going to die. He's going to suffer. Because of why? God's heart is not contingent on who we are. He is God. There is no other. Come on. He is going to move in his own way. So what's the, the deal here? God doesn't have to follow us. We have to follow him. Amen. So from, from back in Hosea's day, we're not going to get into the scripture, but most of you know, the prophet Hosea, which is the, the first what we call minor prophet. In, in the Bible, God was so upset how people went after other gods and false gods that he told Hosea, I need for you to feel what I feel. And so he told him, I want you to marry a prostitute. Her name is Gomer. Not Gomer Pyle, just Gomer. And, um, and he's like, what? Yes, go marry a prostitute. And so since he was a true prophet, because, you know, most prophets are only going to prophesy to make people happy. Again, that's part of that whole dynamic. I'm not going to get into that. But can you imagine you getting a, a prophecy like that? Get thee behind me, Satan. That can't be God. This is not God. Because God wanted him to experience what he was experiencing. You think that God has no heart? You think that we do things and, we, oh, and, and God that doesn't affect him? Hello? That's, that's crazy. But that is part of the mentality of the, the church of our time. We do things simply because we want to. We're number one. It's not him. Come on. We don't think about how he feels. He has feelings. We don't think about, you know, well, what, what I do, whether it will please him or hurt him. We don't think like that. It's all about us. Help me, Jesus. So he went and married Gomer. And she continued her lifestyle. And when he wanted to cut her loose, when he said, no, I can't deal with this. God will speak to him, go and find her, and bring her back home. Now, us as humans, 
right now, some of us are, oh my God. Really? And I'm sure the prophet was feeling that way. But what God was trying to tell him and for him to experience is this. That's what they do to me all the time. Hello? And at one point, he lost her. And she didn't care. He had to go and buy her back or redeem her. And you know what I found out is, is very interesting? That one of the things that God was looking for was, are we as human beings willing to do what he would do? But of course not, because we live in a time, especially now, um, I have to say when I first got saved many, many moons ago, it was different. The level of commitment was different. People, man, they would spend $120 on a Bible. Come on. Yeah. And, you know, it was totally different. But today, everything is about you and me. Everything. And, 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 and the world knows that, so it appeals to that to us. It's, it's about you. Do you. You ever hear that? Do you. No, man, if you're a Christian, get that out of your vocabulary. You don't do you. You do Christ. Come on. Yeah. It's all about me. No, I feel this way. I've got, hello? Come on. And so, and so another incident is when uh, uh, the Lord appears to Abraham. Abraham, you know the miracle child I gave you? I want you to go and sacrifice him for me. And, and the verbiage is interesting. He says, uh, sacrifice your son, your only son. And then I stopped to wonder. I wonder if Hosea would have said, nah, bro, no. I'm not going to do that. First of all, I'm a godly person. I'm not going to marry a prostitute. Secondly, she, you know, I can't deal with that stuff. Uh -uh. What, what would have been different then? How about if Abraham would have said, Lord, this makes no sense. You gave me this child in my old age as a miracle child. Now you want him back? No, Lord. Now, you know that that sounds crazy, and right now some of us are thinking, man, that'd be hard for, for them to do that and to say no, but think about it. If you don't have a, a solid understanding of the Bible and God, and your relationship is based on something else, how many times have we told God no, thinking that it was the right thing? Come on. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is that he, you know, his son was, was uh, 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 some, some scholars say he was about 18 years old. He wasn't a baby. And his son had a clue because his son knew that he was a miracle baby. And Abraham said, come on, we're going to go worship the Lord. <laughs> you know the story. Yeah. And, and right, he goes like, okay, I see you have sticks, fire, but where's the sacrifice? Right then he knew because if it was me and my dad was telling me and I look and shoot, shoot, I'm 18 years old. You're nine, you're 100 years old. You ain't going to catch me. <laughs> I'm gone. But he allowed himself. Do you see it? Do you see it? He allowed himself, just like the father was telling Jesus. That's why we read this verse and we think it's so awesome. But the meat behind it. I'm looking for someone that will go and redeem a people that prostitute. Our relationship. I will do it. That's the heart of God, y'all. 
That's the heart of God. You think the heart of God is just blessing us? That's a byproduct of it. That's the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Come on. And his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. But we want all the things added onto us without putting the kingdom first. But that happens because of our perspective. It, it, that that kind of uh, 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 causes us to look at what our relationship with God is really all about. Amen. All right. So ever since the fall of man, God had a plan. From the very beginning, they messed up. They ran and hid. You know the story. They covered themselves with fig leaves. I, mean, I don't know how much that covers, but. They covered, and then the Lord says, hey, man, what are you doing? Where, where are you? Oh, we were afraid, and we ran. He said, man, I'm going to take care of you. What did he do? Sacrificed an animal and shed blood. Right then and there, the very beginning of the fall of mankind, God had a plan. He was letting them know that, with, that with, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And he covered them. Are you all here? And his plan started. And, and, you know, God's timing is not our timing. You know, I was thinking, well, God, why don't you send Jesus, you know, like two weeks after they messed up. That's why I would have done it. He waited thousands of years because things had to play out. God, during all that time, didn't just sit down and said, okay, I'm going to wait till, you know, uh, uh, um, this time and then I'll send Jesus. No, he, things had to play out. People had to know that they were still in the image of God and that they had a choice to serve him or to not he didn't want to take care of their problem right away. And sometimes that's the way we are. We want instant things. Lord, I believe for, you, for this. You want it instant. And God says, no, no, I, I, I got to see who you are. I, ha I have to see if you have really have faith in me or you just want what, I, what you want from me. And that's why the children of Israel had to go through the wilderness. God wasn't being a, a mean God. He did it for their benefit. Oh, oh, oh. You mean to tell me that I'm going through what I'm going through and it's for my benefit? Yes. Because first of all, the devil has no place in your life. He does not have the authority or the power to destroy you or anything like that. If you're going through something, be sure that the rock is following you like the rock followed them in the wilderness. And that rock is Christ. And what he's looking for is if what's in you is really real. Or do you think just because you come to church that that fulfills your relationship with God? Come on, y'all. Woo! 2024 is on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so his plan was fulfilled the day Jesus was born and died on Calvary. My friend, we have to, we have to be more connected. To the cross. All right. So let's move along. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with what? Compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. 
So now here's Jesus, and he's walking the earth. He's, he's being the, the example that he wants us to be, and so on and so forth. And he comes, and he sees all these people, and that moves him. Say the heart of God. See, that's what moves God. That, that's the heart of God. For many of us, that doesn't move us at all. But that's what moved him. And if we want a right relationship with God, we have to know what moves him. Not what moves us. It says he looked at them and he got compassion. There's another passage that it says he looked at the people. The shortest verse in the Bible. And Jesus wept. Now, we can cry for a whole lot of things. We can cry if we lose our job. We can cry if we can't pay our mortgage. We will cry if, if, if somebody hurts us, uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. But do we cry for what Jesus cries for? Because if not, then we're missing his heart. And remember what the Bible says. The Bible says that he took our heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh, meaning a compassionate heart. Oh, Lord, help us. I'm just a sower, y'all. That's all I'm doing. I can't force you to do anything. God can't force you to do anything. But what you have to do it's really think about your relationship with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And he didn't do that for nothing. I would imagine if Jesus walked the earth today and he looked at the churches. You know how many churches, uh, chairs will be flying and tables will be overturned? It's the truth. So he had compassion. Look at the next verse. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful. But there it is. No secret. So he looks at the people and, and the disciples see them just as people. But the heart of the Lord sees them differently. He says, yo, y'all, that's the harvest. This is why I came. This is why I'm going to die. This is why I'm going to uh, rise up again. For them, because my heart is after the people. He said, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Sad statement. Hello? People go, what is Jesus thinking? What would Jesus do? You remember that time that we had that whole thing? What would Jesus do? It's correct. And, and you know... What would Jesus do? His heart. He's looking for what? Laborers. He's looking for people that would have his heart. And if you're going to have his heart, my friend, it'll break the spirit of selfishness off of us. Because you can't be selfish and have his heart. Well, what's good for me? What do I get out of this? What's in it for me? No wonder, man. No wonder the church is so weak. You know, no, no wonder, you know, people go from church to church to church. They're just trying to find the best thing for them. They're not interested in doing it for the Lord. So, most of you know my testimony. When I was in New York, I was a mess. I thought I was going to die, a dauphine, all that kind of stuff. Been shot at. Been, I mean, just, you know the life. And, um, and no laborers. So, for 10 years, I was in that mess. And there were no laborers around us. I think, just like the cops, even the police were afraid to go into the South Bronx let alone laborers. Uh, so let's finish this, and I'll, I'll finish the story. Next verse says, 
Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What do we pray for? What moves you? What makes you cry? Hello? He says, when you pray, this should be your prayer because this prayer is my heart. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. My friend, West Chicago, the harvest is here. West Chicago, the surrounding cities. The Lord is saying, where are my laborers? Watch it, next verse says. Is there another? Is there? Mm. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I'm giving that. <laughs> They're like, where is it? Where? <laughs> I'm just keeping you on your toes. So he says, he continues to, says, to say, the harvest is ripe. And there's only two things farmers know. Either the harvest is ripe or it's green. If it's green, it's not ready. Right? If it's green, it's not ready. If it's ripe, if you don't reap, you're going to lose. So how do we know? We don't. I wish that God would give us these special glasses that, you know, would show us the ripe ones and the green ones. No, really. I ain't going to waste my time over here. Because it's green, they're not ready. They're ripe over here. So when I was in New York City, my friend, there weren't laborers. As a matter of fact, people would say, that dude, he's going to die a dauphin. That guy's going to end up dead. He's going to end up OD'd in, in, in some shooting gallery. And they were right. I believed it. I didn't think I would, I would get out of the South Bronx. I thought I would die a drug addict. But then a laborer came. And while everybody was saying, that dude ain't no good and so on, guess what? God was saying, that guy is ripe. You don't see it. All you see is the bad. All you see is the negative. But he is ripe. He is crying out for answers. He is crying out to finally be delivered. Oh, you're not hearing me. So while everybody was saying, ah, he's no good. God was saying, no, 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 he's ripe. When they were saying he will amount to nothing. No, no, he is ripe. All I need is a laborer that would dare to go into the South Bronx and, and, and speak to someone that is ripe for me. Because we don't know. Maybe five years before that, I was green. I wasn't ready. So maybe you have talked to people in the past and, and you are turned off, feel rejected. It might just be you talked to someone that was green, they weren't ready. But, it, but things don't stay green forever. Come on. Maybe you need to go back to family, friends, coworkers that at one time you try to be an example, try to share with them, and they shut you down. They made fun of you. But now they may be ripe. It's his heart. It's what he died for. Are you all with me? Man, I got to move right along. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. It says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Again, read the Gospels and you'll see the heart of God. 
Jesus reflects the heart of God. He talked about reaching people. He talked about who you are, your purpose. Lord, what's my purpose on the earth? Twin souls. No, no, I mean, you, my purpose is not to be a millionaire. Uh, you know, I've been believing for that Ferrari. I think that's my purpose. Oh, you ain't here. You think I trip over our church? I used to. I used to say, like, Lord, what's the problem? How come the church is not full? We should be in two services by now. I know I'm a good teacher. No, no, come on. You think I trip about that? I don't trip about that. You know why? That is not my emphasis. As long as I know my relationship with God and what his heart is. Because after I got saved, I went back to New York, found my sister who was on drugs longer than me. And pulled her out of there and she got saved. And then I went again and, and I saw my friend who I couldn't stand. No, seriously. I would stay away from this dude, but we shot drugs together. So junkies, you know, the people that do drugs, they don't have to like each other. <laughs> and I, I went back and I ran into him. And, you know, he said, hey, how are you doing? And he had a big, for those of you who are of that time, Colt 45. The big, hey, he put it in my, no, no, bro, I'm okay. Then he took out this big joint. Come on, bro, like old time. No, man, I don't do that. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I said, Lo, listen, man, I came, Jesus Christ saved my life. And that dude went off. Now watch this. He was ripe. But he fought it. He said, what in the world are you talking about? That doesn't exist. I said, I'm different, man. Because at that point, my friend, it wasn't my heart. It was God's heart in me. Oh, you're here. So then, you know, I, I shared with him my experience. And he went off. He was screaming, spitting. And so then he grabbed me. And he threw me against the wall. Pow! And I hit the wall, and no lie, my first reaction was, I'm going to kick this dude's butt. <laughs> but watch it. But the love of God constrained me. And I told him this. I said, Tito, there's nothing you can do to me right now that would take away what I have inside of me. And that dude broke and wept like a baby because he was what? Ripe. And right there in that hallway, he accepted Christ. Amen. Listen to me. And then he became a pastor and, and he worked in the women's ministry. And he's been, the first time I went to Africa and the first time I went to Burma and Old Spirit was with him. And God used him to reach a bunch of people because it's the way it works. You think one person gets saved and that's it? No, uh, uh The potential of that one person bringing a bunch of other people to Christ is amazing. Hello? Oh, Lord, help us. So he says, you're the light of the world. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. I'm, well, I'm reading here and it's up there. So he says, let your light shine before men. Now look, no condemnation. I, these type of messages makes people uncomfortable because they feel pressured. Oh my God. I, no, no, no. Come on. That's not the Lord. The Lord is saying, if you love me, 
Just know my heart. Just know what I value. Know why I came and died on the cross. That's all. So, so he is saying, it, it, let your light shine. You're the light of the world. Remember I said before, people are tripping. Oh, my God, it's getting worse. Oh, the darkness. Oh, and, and listen to me very carefully. It doesn't matter who's in office. It's not about politics, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not about the economy. It's not about all we, You can turn around and complain till you turn blue. But if you're not the light, nothing changes. Right? And I said uh, last week, I said, if you go into a dark room, don't be frustrated that you're tripping over stuff and don't get mad. <laughs> Just flip the light on. It's that simple. And this is what he's saying. What he's saying is, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now watch. You ever wonder why most of the promises that are shared with you have to do with you? God doesn't want you to suffer from anxiety. He doesn't want you to be depressed. He doesn't want you to be broke. I mean, the, the Bible says that he, part, part of what he did on Calvary was to provide us with healing and all that kind of stuff. But do you think that it ends there? He did it so that you can be a light. And when you're not a light, you will suffer from all those things that he paid the price for. Because the light is you not coming to someone and, and telling them everything that's wrong. Oh, gosh. No, the light is, is, is when everything is wrong and we still say, but I trust God. And I'm not reacting to the things that are going on. Because when you react to things, my friend, you will make the wrong decision. You know that, and I know that. Right? You don't react to the world. You don't react to the economy. You don't react to all those things. You are the light of the world. You say, in spite of what's going on, I know that God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Hey. Now, don't trip. If, 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 if you find yourself complaining don't, don't condemn yourself. I mean, God knows we're human, right? But we have to know the truth because only the truth will what? do what? And so notice what he says. He said, be the light that they may see. Okay, so I'm the light. What are, the, what are they going to see? How do I know that I'm the light? Well, he makes it plain. That they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven well I thought it wasn't about works no no Bible talks about bad works and good works good works is the kingdom of God bad works is the work of this world system so he says be the light well how, how I know if I'm being the light because of good works I'm doing good works. What's good works, my, man, uh, my friend? The Bible talks about it, right? When we're able to love, to forgive, to give, to do all the things that Jesus did because Jesus came to work. And, and, and I'm, I'm winding down. Oh, Lord, help me. John, chapter 4, verse 33. It says, therefore, the disciples said to one another, As, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Next verse. Jesus said to them, my food, because they were talking about him, right? They were hungry. They thought he was hungry. He says, my food is to do the what? The will of him who sent me and to finish his work. 
Now, what you and I don't know is that the work continues. Because he finished the work on Calvary, and it says it is finished, but then he left it in our hands. And what was his work? To die on the cross, to pay the price, and then to pass the baton to us. Hello? Because the work continues. That's why he said, be the light. Now, we have to examine ourselves. Because even as Christians, among Christians, we do things that are not the light. I'm going to leave that one right there. So he says, be a light, show your good works. What's the good works? What he worked for. What did he work for? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. My friend, this is what it's all about. I don't know what we're caught up in. I don't know what your value system is. I don't know, but I, I, know, I know one thing. If you've come to the Lord, my friend, you have to understand his heart. You have to understand his heart. I'm going to finish with this. There's more, but this is a series. So it says, well, I went back to that little tiny. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are what? Already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages. Now, this blew me away. Because in essence, what he's saying is you win souls, you get paid. Oh, you ain't trying to hear me. That's what he's saying. He who reaps. Now, you only can reap if, 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 if they're ripe. But how are you going to know? He says, and, and the word wages there, guess what the Greek is? Money. You mean to tell me God is saying that if I win souls, he will bless me? Yes. That's not why you do it. But God says, but there's the key. You know why? Because you're doing my heart. And there's people that will do anything for money. No, it's true. We do anything for money not realizing that God has a kingdom economy. He knows how to bless us. And if you make money, it's not the kind of money that God can give you. So notice what he says. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for what? Eternal life. So you know when people say uh, 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 um, for us to uh, like give and they'll say it into your heavenly account. Right? I believe that. I believe that when you go there everybody is not on the same level. Mm -mm. You think that you're going to go up there and just because you're saved and, you, and then you're going to be on the same level as Paul? Uh-uh. That doesn't mean that he's better than you or anything, but guess what? There's, there's going to be a difference. And this is what he's saying. It says that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. So here it is. The Bible says some will sow Come on. Right? So even if, because I have to say this to you, and then I'm closing. Before I got saved, God had people planting seeds in me. I'm serious. I remember just going through the TV, and then all of a sudden, uh, I forget the name of that um, show. It's a Christian show. And all of a sudden, I just stopped. And the guy was talking about Jesus and what he did. And it caught my attention. I don't know if I really 
open my heart to him at that day. I felt like I did. But then I kept doing what I was doing. I go to 42nd Street, which at the time, Times Square, was the pits. In fact, if you were a drug addict in the Bronx or whatever, they said if you find yourself in Times Square, you've hit the lowest. It's beautiful now. It was terrible then. All they had was rated X shows, and, and I mean, it was terrible. But we were down there, me and Norma's brother, Cheto, who has been here, and, and we were walking, and then all of a sudden, because I love art, they had like this art thing going on. And I said, man, let's check this out. And I go, and, and, and there's this picture, so the guy is holding it, beautiful. Somebody painted it beautiful. And he says, this let me tell you the story behind the picture. He said, this is Nicodemus. I said, who the heck is Nicodemus? He said, he's the one. If you want to find out what he did, go to the next picture. Well, I wish we could do this too. And I go to the next one. And he explains, he came to Jesus by night. You're not hearing me. And so on and so forth. If you want to follow the story, go to the next, next picture. And he asked Jesus, what does it mean to be born again? Yeah, almost tears coming down my eyes. Those were seeds that the Holy Spirit was planting, waiting for the right time. When the guy came and told me about Jesus, I was ready. But guess what? Those guys that did that, they sold they were sowing. Even though I didn't accept Christ right there. And they, they could have said, oh man, this ain't working. No, 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 my friend. They were sowing seeds. So if you're thinking, uh, you know, I went to this person, they didn't get saved. No, just you sharing your testimony or saying something, you're sowing a seed. And this is what it's saying. That the one who sows the seed and the one who reaps, they both. We'll rejoice together and be blessed. Hallelujah. The heart of God. When we grab a hold of this, when we grab a hold of the heart of God, it will cause changes in your life. It will cause you to perceive things differently. It will cause you to think, does my life reflect his heart? Because he's not interested in taking anything from you, my friend. He's trying to get something to you. It will, it will help you in your decision making. When you go, oh man, this and that and the. And then you get in touch with the heart of God and God says, uh-uh. Whether you know it or not, that person may be ripe. The person you prayed for and the person that, you, that you've been crying uh, 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 to, you know, to get saved and so on, they, he said, now is the time. And what has hurt the church is that the devil who is opposite of God's heart knew the key and, and he worked at getting the church to take his eyes off of God's heart and to put it on his blessings so he doesn't have to do a whole lot if that's all he does my friend then that's why, that's why we look at the impact that this world system has and how dark it is. It's only because the enemy, the prince of the power of air, has successfully convinced the church to rely more on his presence instead of his presence. What about me? What about me? 
What about what I want? Yeah, what about what you want? If it's not connected with the heart of God, my friend, it's futile. And that's why there's so many pastors that quit the ministry. Because they've allowed themselves to be duped. Can I, can I, I know we're going over, but can I say this? They allow themselves to be duped with church growth seminars. And they go to those seminars and hear, and, and trust me, I'm going to say this, I don't care who's listening. Those things are not wrought by God because God is not interested in numbers. And when thousands of people were following Jesus, it wasn't because he was calling them or he felt like, man, this will, this will validate who I am. He turned to the disciples and he turned to the people and started teaching. He said, whoever does not want to eat my flesh and drink my blood, he is not worthy of the kingdom of God. Thousands of people left. You think that God is going to judge churches by their numbers? Ooh, that church has 5,000 people. Yes, you did well. You got 50 people. Mm. You think that? We don't know the heart of God. Then he turned to the disciples. Are you going to leave me too? Do you think that Jesus was afraid to say things because he would lose people? That's why the whole, the whole thing about uh, 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 seeker friendly, you think that's of God? How can that be of God when Jesus came and, 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 and said things that offended people? You think he was afraid, oh, nobody's going to get saved because I'm too hard. That's the problem with the church today. <sighs> anyway, it's our challenge for 2024. The first message you've heard in this church this new year. You're here for a reason. You're hearing this for a reason. Because we have now a choice. Go on in 2024, invoking the name of the Lord only when we want something. Or we're going to represent his heart on the earth. Am I going to call my friends and say, hey man, Jesus loves you. You don't know if they're right, they'll accept the Lord right there your neighbors, your co-workers, or are you thinking, as long as I get what I want, I know I'm under grace. You're mistaken, my friend. You don't know the Bible as well as you think you do. And if you stick around, you know that I'm going to share the truth. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, because I'm just a sower. And God forbid that I don't share the truth. And God says, you're not worthy to be a preacher. Why don't you stand with me? Hallelujah. To be honest with you, all we need is five soul winners. That's all we need. Five people that would say, man, I want to operate in the heart of God. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. But one thing I do know is I want the heart of God to flow through me. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. Sometimes I feel I'm not worthy. But one thing I know, I want his heart to be expressed through me. And that's a beautiful thing because God doesn't say, oh, no, I give my heart to the righteous person. Uh-uh. 
That didn't work. He told the Pharisees, you're a bunch of snakes because you think you're righteous. No, no. He chooses the weak things of this earth to confound the wise. All we need is five soul winners in this church. Maybe 10. Maybe 15. Maybe 20. But I'm going to tell you what. They're ripe. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. They're ripe. How many of you are believing for your family, your whole family, sons, daughters, aunts, to be saved? Raise your hand. There's my soul winners. Because if you're believing it, the next step is sharing it. Because you can believe something. And not put it into practice. You can pray for God to do something that you're not willing to do. Lord, send these people away. They're hungry. They have no food, Jesus said. You feed them. You have that burden. And then guess what? You also have the means to do this. And they were like, impossible. If you're looking for your family, kids, and so on, friends to be saved, give them a call. Go see them. Because what's the point of wanting it to happen? Lord, send someone their way. Yeah, he will, you. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? We've been taught wrong. So, if you say, this year, God can count on me to be a soul winner. I need his help. By the way, the Bible says no one will come to God but by the Holy Spirit. So you're not doing it alone. He will lead you. He will guide you. When a person is ripe, you can say, hey, man, the cow jumped over the moon. <laughs> they, I'm serious. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I need to preach a sermon to them or, oh, I need to say the right things. No, all you have to do in the, for the most part is to share what Christ did for you. And not worry that they will look at you and think, oh, you, you, well, you're not perfect. No, nobody is. That's part of the testimony. God did this for me in spite of me. And he will do it for you in spite of you. So if that's you, guys, and I think we're going to, we're going to cut the stream right here. Or maybe.